Oh, hi, this is Mike. I'm ready to start. All right. Okay. We're on the verge of doing great stuff in this class. Okay. Uh, a lot of times uh, at this point in the class, students start to feel uh, a little frustrated because they want to do more with the layout than we've covered in class so far. And again, depending on the student and just how frustrated they are, uh, I will either recommend them to, to look up something on W3 schools or I'll give them an example in lab or, or whatever. But we're, we're almost at the point where we're going to talk about in much more great detail how to control our layout. Because all of our web pages so far, unless you've went off and done some things on your own, just are simply a sequence of one thing after another. Boom, 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 like that. And for very, very simple sites, that's OK. But again, um, we want to use our layout to help organize the content on our page, to help people find stuff better, and so on. So we want to work to be able to exert control over the layout of our pages. As we move into that, an issue will become greater um, than it has been so far the, this semester. And so we're going to, before we get into that, we're going to take just a little diversion and talk about the problem of browser compatibility. All right. One thing to remember is you as a web developer have no knowledge, well, I won't say no knowledge. You have little control about how people are accessing your websites. In other words, I'm going to pull up websites on this machine here, which is a Windows PC running Windows XP and, I don't know, some version of Firefox and some version of Internet Explorer. All right. The next person that accesses that page might be running a Linux machine running Opera the Opera web browser. Uh, next person that accesses a web page might be running an iPad using the Safari browser, and so on and so forth. You know, so you don't really have. You know, people can access the web from uh, any variety of different things, and really, that's the power of the web. All right, the web really is is uh, uh, essentially a, a set of protocols. And what a protocol is, is this a, an agreed upon way of communicating. You know, that's all a, a, a protocol is. You know, we have in everyday life, we have some very informal protocols that we follow, right? If you pass someone in a hall that you need, you'll, you know, you'll, hey, how's it going? And they'll, yeah, fine, how are you? You know, you don't actually expect that person to tell you how they are, all right? And you're not going to tell that person how you are. But it's sort of like a, just an agreed upon way of, hey, you're acknowledging that person, you're indicating that, that you know this person, and you're greeting them to wish them well. Um, in the web world, the, the protocols are a little bit more formal. And so far, we have been talking about the language, and, and I don't think we've mentioned protocols before, but we've done it sort of on a very informal way. Now we want to get a little more formal in talking about the language of HTML because we want to really know that the only thing as a web developer that we can know for sure is that whoever is accessing our pages is following a certain protocol. But we don't have control over what kind of machine they're using. We don't have any control over how big their screen is. We don't have any control over those things. And our job and, and really, our challenge is to do the best we can to make our page look good regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the environment that it's being viewed in. Remember, when someone asks for a web page, they access a web server. The web server delivers that page to the client. So if I go to google.com there, a copy of that web page comes to my machine. All right? And my machine views it using a piece of browser software. That same thing would happen on my phone, on an iPad, on a Nintendo DS, on any other means of browsing the internet. All right? A request is made for a page, the page comes back, and the browser displays it. Well, we assume for the most part that the browser is going to get it right, and the browser is going to display it the way that it was intended. But we can't guarantee that. What, why can't we guarantee that the browser is going to display things correctly? 
why is there the potential issue of browser compatibility issues? The issue of browser compatibility issues, whatever. That's a little redundant, but you know what I mean. Why do we have to worry about this? Well, who wrote web browsers? People did, right. I said, we may not know who, right? But people wrote web browsers. And what does that mean? It means that there are people just like you. And what does that mean? That means that some things they do right, some things they make mistakes on. All right? The specifications for the languages and the protocols are developed by that organization called the W3, uh, W3C.org. Now that's different than W3 schools. I mean, they took their name from, you know, uh, W3 schools took their name from the W3C folks, but they're, they're different things. So the organization that, that creates these standards and creates these protocols is the W3C. And let's go visit their website. And if you go to their website, you'll see a lot of stuff. And one of the things that you'll see is, is standards for web design and applications, HTML, what is HTML, what is XHTML, blah, 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 blah. Somewhere here, we get the right link. We will find the specifications for HTML. And what the specifications are are the rules. The rules for how HTML should work. Let's see, I'm not finding the link right here. Um, but somewhere on here. Let's do a search. All right, here's the actual specification for HTML. This is the rules. This is the constitution of HTML. All right, this is all the rules about what HTML is. Please don't spend a lot of time reading this. <laughs> all right, why not? Because this is written in a very formal language. I mean, let's pick something that we know. We know about links. And if we read this, We'll see the language is very sort of technical and not necessarily easy to understand. Why is that? These pages, the specification, isn't meant for your average web developer. This specification is meant for the people that make web browsers so that they know how their web browsers should behave and how their web browsers should display some text. Now, What's the problem then? We have a couple problems. Problem number one, the people that write web browsers are human, so they may make mistakes. Number two, the specification is very long and complicated. So it could, be it could easily be misinterpreted. All right? And number three, the specification is developing alongside the people that are making the browsers. It's not as though all of a sudden the specification appears 
and then the web developers can take it and make a browser that, that uses it. For example, the specification for HTML5 has been, being, has been developed over a period uh, of years. Now, it's not done yet, so a browser maker can't guarantee that they're going to do everything in HTML5 because the specification isn't done yet. So, as the, this group is working on developing the specification, browser, work, uh, browser uh, makers are working on incorporating those features into their browsers. So, you know, it, it's the, the, the proverbial race with a moving finish line, finish line all right? You're not going to know exactly how it is until the specification is finalized. So for those three reasons, all right, browser compatibility issues uh, exist. The, the people that make them are human. The specification is complicated and easily can be misunderstood. And finally, it's a, a moving goal, a moving destination in many cases. Now, Here's the bad news about browser compatibility issues. The reasons for the browser compatibility issues don't matter at all. Why not? Because it's your web page and your web page needs to work. All right? Could you imagine if your job, if you're hired by uh, 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 some organization to develop their web page and you know, you spend some time to develop their web page and it doesn't work in Internet Explorer. And you tell the person that you're developing the web page for, well, I followed all the rules and, you know, there's a bug with the, with the browser. So that's why the page doesn't display correctly. Thank you very much. Can I have my money? You know, what are they going to say? Of course not. It doesn't matter the reason for the problem. The problem is you have to deal with the situation that you're in. You have to deal with the fact that browsers are imperfect. And you have to make your web page work as well as it can, even taking into account the fact that many browsers are imperfect. So, what strategy do you take? It sounds like a pretty grim picture. Well, it's not that grim. It is challenging at times. This probably is one of the most challenging aspects of web development. But, there's sort of a two-fold strategy you take. Number one, you make sure you're following the rules perfectly. All right? So that's the first part of the strategy, is you do your best to follow the rules completely and make sure there isn't a problem with your code where you're misinterpreting something and doing something wrong. The second thing, which is sort of, the fail-safe and trumps it is extensive testing across many browsers. All right? So don't just have one web browser on your machine that you're doing web development on. Have several browsers. In fact, it's good if you can have access to several versions of different browsers. Because again, even within Internet Explorer, not all versions of Internet Explorer will run the same. So therefore, it's good to have access to a number of different versions of a particular browser. So we'll talk a little bit about testing. And one note about testing is it's a good idea not to wait till the very end to test. If you wait till the very end to test, you're liable that you're going to find all your problems at once and you're going to have a mess to go in and try to correct it. It's better to do a little bit of a coding, a little bit of testing, and so on until um, uh, that, way you, that way you find the problems as they occur and you don't wait till the end and find a million problems. Now, following the rules. You might ask yourself, gee, we've been following the rules, haven't we? We've been coding, we've been doing what you've said in class, we've been following the book. That's true, but there's some things that, again, either we kind of skipped over or we didn't mention or whatever that now we want to take a closer look at. All right? How do we know if we're following the rules? Well, we could stare at the code and then go back and look at the browser specification and make sure that we followed all the rules, but that would be painstaking. That would be difficult to do. Fortunately for us, there are programs that do that work for us. 
there are programs that validate our HTML code and tell us if we've broken any rules. All right. What kind of rules am I talking about? Well, there's several different rules. And again, we've already, we've already talked about a lot of these rules. For example, a start tag should have an ending tag. So if I do this, and omit the ending tag, we've broken a rule. All right. What happens when you break a rule? It depends. Depends on what the browser decides to do with it. Ideally, if you follow the rules, the browser will display the page the way that you've intended it. If you break the rules, the browser essentially guesses at what you wanted to do. All right. The browser takes a shot. Hey, you follow the rules. Uh, you haven't followed the rules correctly. I'm going to try to. I'm going to do my best to display this page, but it may not be exactly what you want. All right. So that's one example of breaking a rule for getting an ending tag. Another example would be to have your your tags improperly nested. So, for example, I could have a paragraph. Something like that. Those tags are improperly nested. We broke the rules. All right. The browser is going to guess at what you think you mean, it, what 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 it thinks you mean, and it may get it right. It may not. Or one browser may get it right. Other browsers may get it wrong. All right. Another thing that's wrong is if you use uh, a tag in a wrong place. Now this is something I've commented on some of your labs. Uh, I can't guarantee that I've caught them all, but for example, right now in the head section, the only thing we should have is the title and the style information, but we shouldn't have things like H1 in the header, in the head section. That stuff belongs in the body. See? Even that kid knows. They're like, of course it belongs in the body, you know. Where else would it be? Alright. So if I have a tag in the wrong place. Now I haven't necessarily talked about this in class. I, I may have mentioned it, or I may have mentioned it on an individual assignment. But the validator, the program that we're going to run our code through, is going to catch this. Because if we break the rules, again, the browser guesses. Um, let's see, uh, any others? Oh, if we have a tag and we leave something out. For example, if I were to have a head tag, an end head tag, and let's say I have a link to my style sheet, but I've omitted the title. One of the rules of HTML is that there's a title tag needed there. There needs to be a title tag. All right. So these are examples of the kind of things that you run into. Uh, other things would be like if you get the name of an attribute wrong. If I'm making a link and I say a h h ref equals, that's the wrong name for an attribute. All right. And therefore, I'll get an error. All right. So essentially what this does is think of this as being like the spelling slash grammar checker in Word. It doesn't, make, doesn't mean that your page is good if it passes validation. It right? doesn't mean it's well designed. doesn't mean that it does what you wanted it to do. It simply means that you followed all the rules. You, know, you can write a paper for English class that's perfect nonsense, but follow all the rules of the grammar. Right? Just like you could write a web page that's perfect nonsense, but it follows the rules of HTML, so it's valid HTML, but you know it, it's meaningless. So think of that. Uh, think of this validator as being like the spell check or grammar check. Now, one last thing 
before we dive into the validator and look at some examples and we'll see how good of a job that I've done all right, in, in, in class. Um, when we validate our code, we have to tell the validator and we have to tell the browser, we should tell the browser, which version of HTML we are using. All right? Because there's slight variances in how HTML is displayed and so on and so forth and some things are legal in one place, not legal in another. So the idea is, is we have to tell the browser what rules we're following. All right, what standard we're following. And you do that through what's called the doc type or document type. And what I've done is I've gone in and I've posted to Angel the document type I want you to use in this class. So we can go into Angel and if we look under resources, I'm pretty sure, we'll see the doc type that I want you to use. Doc type to use. So we can copy that and put it in the front of one of our pages. Let's take one of our pages that we've done recently. And the doc type, in addition to the doc type, we have a slightly different HTML tag. We have an HTML tag that has some of these other attributes in it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There's just some extra attributes to it. So I'm going to go and I'm going to put this doc type in here. Now, if you're looking closely, you'll notice where it says that we are actually using not HTML, but XHTML. Ooh. XHTML. That sounds cooler than just plain old HTML, right? What is XHTML? Well, we've been doing it, we've been really, for the most part, following the rules of XHTML all along. What is XHTML? It's like HTML except for a couple extra rules, for the most part. And here's some of those extra rules. First of all, all tags should be lowercase. All right? Um, in all the examples I've done, at least to my knowledge, all the tags I've been using have been lowercase to begin with. So if you notice, all my tags are lowercase. All right. So that shouldn't be really a problem getting used to. If you have been using uppercase, just make sure you switch to lowercase. So that's the first rule of, of uh, XHTML. In addition to all tags, all attribute names. For example, href attribute. In plain old HTML, that's legal. But in XHTML, you want to make it lowercase. The other thing is that our attribute names I'm sorry, not our attribute names, but our attribute values should be enclosed in quotes. For example, that is legal in HTML to not have quotes around the address of the web page. In XHTML, though, that's not legal, and we should have quotes around it. The last rule of XHTML that's different than HTML is that every tag in XHTML needs to have a closing tag. Alright, every tag needs to have a closing tag.
for example, let's look at this image tag. And I'll put it on two lines so that we can see it better. In HTML, I'd be able to do this and have my opening image tag and no ending image tag. And HTML wouldn't care about that. In XHTML, I need to close that tag, even if there's nothing between the start and ending tag. Between most tags, there's something between the start and ending tag, right? Well, with an image, there's no, really nothing between the start and ending tag. So, XHTML says, well, yeah, you got to put the ending tag even if there's nothing in between it. So, that's legal. I can also take a shortcut, which is what I normally do, and I can do that, which is a shorthand that says that this is both the start and ending tag rolled into one. All right, this is what's called an empty tag. All right, the start and end tag are rolled into one. All right. And of course, your tags need to be properly nested. That's really a rule in both. But if you notice, for the most part, I've been following these rules anyhow. Even though I haven't called it XHTML, I've been pretty much following these rules because I almost always type in lowercase the tags. I put the attributes in quotes and I don't put a starting tag without an ending tag. I put the slash to indicate that it's an empty tag. All right, now, you know what? There may be other rules too. Remember that specification is long, all right? And it's complicated to read. And I have missed something. I, I may have missed something. I, I don't know for sure that I missed something. I might have missed something now. So, rather than eyeballing and looking and making sure that this code is val valid, I'm going to run this through the validator. All right, the validator is again like the spell check or grammar check, except it looks at HTML or XHTML and makes sure that it, it follows the rules. By the way, why are there so many different versions? Well, these things evolve. People have an idea of, of HTML and then they've extended it to say, you know what? If we make the rules of HTML a little more strict, we can maybe do a better job. Uh, you know, eliminating browser compatibility issues and being able to process data and so on and so forth. You know that computers love to have rigidly defined data. You know, computers don't respond very well. You can't just talk in your computer and say, you know what, you know, give me, uh, you know, write a letter to my friend and tell him I'm sorry, but I can't make uh, their party this weekend. And the computer does it, right? Computers don't respond very well to, to, you know, to natural language sort of things. The more strict the rules are in the language that you deal with computers, the better off the computer can handle it. So with, H, with XHTML, they've made the rules a little stricter so that the, the, the browsers and, and, uh, can, can do a better job uh, interpreting it. All right, so let's go to the validator. And the validator can be found at w3c.org. And on the right-hand column, somewhere down here, they have the HTML and markup validator. And you can validate this a couple different ways. If your page is on the web, you can already put, you can put that URL there. You can upload a file, or what most students do is they validate by direct input. By validate for direct input, you get this big box, and essentially, you copy and paste your code into it. So I'm going to go and I'll copy and paste this code into the validator and run it. And yay, no errors. All right. The green line up here says that I pass without an error. Now, there's two warnings here. The warnings you can look at, but pretty much you don't really need to worry about. It's essentially telling me that I, I'm not, um, oh, that um, there's no character uh, encoding information. In other words, I'm not telling you what character set I'm using. Character sets are used like to uh, achieve, you know, in other languages, some of the special characters that they have. 
if this is a standard English, then this UTF-8 is sort of the standard character coding. Now, just like in, in grade school, if you do a good job, you get a sticker. If you do a good job validating your page, you get a little sticker, a little piece of code that you can include on your web page that indicates that your page was validated as valid HTML. Or in this case, XHTML. So now, we have at the bottom of our page the little sticker. This says that we validated this and it's valid XHTML. A lot of times web developers like to put that on their page. That's almost like uh, uh, a slight sort of brag. You know, what that says is, is that says, hey, you know, I know that these pages should validate and I took the effort to, to validate it. it. It's almost like, you know, I don't even know if they do this anymore, but it used to be, you know, the good housekeeping seal of approval, you know, or something like that. It's just a stamp that says, hey, this person cared and they went through this process and they validated the code. Yes? Couldn't you just copy and paste that on every page? Yeah, you could. Um, you, you, you could, but you know, um, if, if someone took the time to look at your code and saw you did that, that wouldn't reflect very, very well upon you. You know, the people that that's going to appeal to are other web designers, right? Uh, you know, the general public's going to look at that and not have any idea what that means. So the people that that would appeal to would be uh, general web designers, and uh, they would be the people who would be they have the capability to go and validate the page yourself. You know, you could just go and type the URL in and validate it and see, you know, if you're suspicious and see if it was valid or not. So, <laughs> yeah, you could, but you don't really gain anything by doing that. Yes? Where did you copy that into the code? I just put it at the very end. It doesn't really matter where you put it. <laughs> do make sure you don't break your code <laughs> by putting it. I've actually had students do that, that they've copied the validation code. And maybe they put it like after the body, and oh, that's wrong. You just broke your code, all right, because it belongs as part of the body. Let's validate the other page in this example. And let's see if there's any problems with that. And there isn't. All right, I'm just two on the ball. I'll copy this code, and we'll put it at the bottom of this page. All right. Let's look at some errors, though. It, it, gee, if I, if, I, if I was on a roll that day and I didn't make any mistakes, let's go and let's force ourselves to make some mistakes so we can see how these errors appear. First of all, if you omit the doc type, let's say I, I forgot to put the doc type in. The validator just like the browser, then it's going to have to guess at what doc type you probably mean. And the browser and the validator are going to assume that you mean sort of an older version of HTML. So, if there's no doc type and I go and validate this, I'll get a message that says, oh, errors found while checking this document is HTML 4.01 transitional. first problem it found is it can't find a doc type. So it's guessing at what you probably mean. So it's going to assume this older default 4.01 version of HTML. And therefore, 
it finds a problem with that because the HTML tag doesn't have the proper attributes to indicate that that's what it is. And it found a problem with my little slash greater than sign, which again, if you remember, is a shortcut to indicate that it's a beginning and ending tag all rolled into one. Um, because, um, again, this is uh, that's an XHTML thing. And then, it doesn't recognize that as an end tag, so it assumes that that head tag is still open. All right? It doesn't realize that that link tag is closed because in HTML it doesn't recognize that. And because the head tag is open, it doesn't think that you can start the body yet. And again, it does not know that that slash greater than is valid because, again, it's HTML. So in this case, omitting the doc type really caused several different problems. Oops. And that's generally the case. One mistake in your code can show up as a bunch of different errors. So let's go and let's put this back to be XHTML and revalidate it. And you'll find that we have no errors. Let's make some other errors other than the doc type. Let's say, for example, I forget the end title tag. That one thing generated two errors. All right. The first error is it tells me it doesn't allow the element link here. Then the second thing it says is it found that it's missing the end tag for the title. Now that might seem a little confusing at first, and that's sort of par for the course. Until you get used to it, these error messages will be a little hard to decipher. But a couple things to keep in mind. One mistake can trigger a bunch of errors. So in this case, I know that there's a problem up here and the error that I can understand says that the end tag for title is omitted. So if I look at my code, I can look and see, eh, I don't have the end tag for title. Now essentially what happened is, because I have no end tag for title, it assumed that this link tag was part of the title which you can't have a link tag in the middle of a title. You just can't do it. Not allowed. And therefore that's where the second error came up. So if I put that back in, it clears up both errors. One thing to be uh, wary of is if you're correcting it in this text box, make sure you copy it back out and save that so you don't make all your corrections here and forget to take a copy of it. All right, what if I make a capital H1? So instead of lowercase h1, which I'm supposed to do with XHTML, I uh, put in a capital H1. Well, that actually generated three errors, having a capital H instead of a lowercase h. Let's go down and let's see if we can figure out and make sense of what those errors mean. First one, element h1 undefined. Well, notice it shows capital H1. XHTML doesn't know uppercase tags. So it doesn't know capital H1 tag. So that's the reason for that error. That error is probably fairly easy to understand, at least compared to the other ones. The next error says the end tag for H1 was found, but there is no start H1 tag. In other words, the H1 tag isn't open. Well, again, keeping in mind that we didn't have a lowercase h1, we had an uppercase h1, what that's saying is it can't find the lowercase h1 tag that started this whole thing. And then lastly, even though it doesn't know what an h1 tag is, 
it's going to complain because it can't find the ending, capital H1 tag. All right, and that's what that third error means. So don't be alarmed when you go to do lab five, all right, where you take one of your old pieces of code and validate it, all right. It may show 30 errors, all right. Those 30 errors might be caused by a couple different things, all right, and it, it's pretty, it, it, uh, you can eliminate those errors pretty quickly. These errors are apt to be confusing at first. Again, but if you have any difficulty uh, interpreting the errors, by all means let me know and I'll try to walk you through it. Let's look at just a couple more error examples here. What if I forget the title? Or better yet, let's say I put the title in the body tag. That's not where it belongs, right? It belongs in the head tag. That generated two errors. I'm surprised. I thought we'd get more. But if we look down here, it gives me this error that says end tag for head, which is not finished. Now that wording's a little puzzling, all right, until you realize what it's saying is it expected to find something in the head tag and it didn't. It found the end head tag before it found something it was looking for. And in this case, what is it looking for? Well, your head tag has to have a title tag inside of it. So, and I think it even gives you that uh, as an example. For example, in the HTML head tag, it must contain a title uh, child element. The second error it gives us is it tells us that the title tag can't be where it is. Remember, I moved it into the body, which again, title doesn't belong in the body, it belongs in the head. Um, let's get rid of the alt attribute for that image. Remember the alt attribute is what assistive technologies um, display or if there's a problem um, viewing the image for other reasons. And it gives me an error and the error says something along the lines of it required an old attribute that wasn't specified. That one's pretty straightforward. All right. Chances are the most common errors that you're going to run into are as follows. Capital tag names. All right. If you've used capital letters, you have to convert them to, to lowercase uh, letters. Not properly nested elements that you've forgotten in tags or you have them nested improperly. Tags in the wrong place. Tags that are supposed to be in the body section that are in the head section, for example. Missing tags, that is, the head doesn't have a title. All right. And lastly, maybe missing attributes, things like forgetting the alt attribute on an image. Any questions about this? Yes? Well, no, and, and that's actually the good thing. The, the question is, is how often do you have to change that to make sure it's, it's uh, up to date? Actually, you would never have to change it, okay? Because look at it this way. That's telling me the rules that I wrote this under. So I wrote this, and this is valid according to these set of rules, HTML 1.0 transitional, all right? Now, Five years from now, all right, they develop XHTML 2.0, all right. This still follows the rules of 1.0, right? 
And the web browser should be savvy enough to say, hey, this was written under the rules of 1.0, and therefore it's going to follow those rules. Now, to be sure, if you're talking about, you know, 20 years down the line, browsers may stop supporting old standards. Browsers may say, hey, we're no longer supporting such and such standard because it's ancient. All right? But you really don't have to go and update it because you've specified the rules that this is following. So therefore, the browser is going to apply those rules. Usually, um, it's not as though each version of the standard completely rewrites the rule book. All right? What each version of the standard usually does is adds a little bit of functionality and maybe adds a new tag or a new attribute or whatever. So it's not like if you did this for 1.0 and 2.0 comes out, it's going to be completely different. It's, it's going to be similar enough to, even if you chose to convert it to 2.0, you wouldn't have that big of a deal to convert it. Now the last thing that we can validate is we can also validate our style sheet code. And I can go into my external style sheet file and I can copy that code. And I can go to the validator. Except I can pick the CS validator, CSS validator. And I can do the same thing. And congratulations, it found no errors. And I get a little sticker for that, too. That I can include on my page. You just get to choose, yeah. It's like going in the doctor's office. You know, you give a Scooby-Doo sticker or a, a Mickey Mouse sticker. Repeat that, please. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's a, that's a good question. They, uh, yeah, it, 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 not a huge difference, but yeah, I, I I can't answer that one. Let's go and put both of these at the bottom of both. And now we have our two with our valid CSS and valid XHTML. I can almost guarantee that you're going to see errors that confuse you. And, and I'm speaking both to the people in class and in, in the people um, that are watching this online. I can almost guarantee because until you get used to reading those error messages, those error messages seem to be very confusing and not necessarily very descriptive. Remember, this is a machine. This is a computer program that's trying to communicate with you. So it's not like, you know, going to say, hey, you know, you forgot a slash here, you know. It knows that you forgot a slash because it applies a very systematic set of rules and, and it finds a violation of them. So it reports it as such. So until you've gotten used to reading those error messages, if you run into problems, let me know, you know. In lab, flag me down, ask me what the error is. Or if you're taking the class online, you know, email me the code and uh, I'll take a look at it and try to decipher the error message for you. One note again, you know, um, if you ask me a question like this or really any question uh, about your code via email, it's always a good idea to send me the code. All right. Uh, sometimes I get students that will send me questions without sending the code and it's almost impossible to, to answer those questions. I, they, they must have a higher opinion of me than deservedly so because I can't figure things out without getting my hands dirty and looking at it. So um, if you run into problems uh, and you send me a question via email, please include the code. All right, we'll see you up in lab.